Hi and welcome. Hen Chess Productions, in partnership with Foxy Openings, presents Magnus Carlsen's secret weapon, the Norwegian Rat. This is a black system versus one e4. I'm Grandmaster Ron W. Henley, and I will be presenting this video. Well, the Norwegian Rat. It comes after e4, g6, 2, d4, and then the very provocative knight to f6. Early history of the North Sea variation. This strange opening was independently invented in the 1980s by Gerard Welling of the Netherlands, and he called it the horseshoe variation. But also Rolf Martens of Sweden, and he called it the Norwegian defense. These names were later replaced by Martens' proposal, quote, the North Sea defense, which shared the honors. All of this was brought to light in an excellent 2008 Chess Cafe article by Stefan Brucker. Well, primarily the opening remained the province of players who lived dangerously, like Grandmaster Johnny Hector, and pub players who wanted to shock their opponents. In 2007, pictured on the left, we can see the book by Jim Bickford, a 94-page pamphlet called The North Sea Variation. But this was published by Ziggy, and lack of distribution and Black's rather poor results relegated this opening to being a dubious sideline. But, to quote Mariah Carey, but then came along a hero. And in spite of a 2010 loss to GM Michael Adams, world champion Magnus Carlsen began to play it in World Blitz events and in his own Banner Blitz shows. The 16th World Chess Champion Magnus Carlsen he was born November 30th. He is Norwegian FIDE International Grandmaster. He is the current Classical World Chess Champion, World Rapid Chess Champion, and World Blitz Chess Champion. Magnus first reached the top of the FIDE World Rankings in 2010, and his peak Classical Chess rating of 2882 is the highest in the history of chess. Magnus also owns the longest confirmed unbeaten streak at elite level with 125 games, spanning a two-year period beginning in July of 2018. But, compared to many world champions of the past, Magnus is accessible, charming, witty, and has a self-deprecating sense of humor combined with a knowledge and appreciation of contemporary culture. In today's chess world, he is a great ambassador for the game and a true rock star with the younger generation. We'll start out in the Norwegian Rat with looking at the h5 gambit. After the moves e4 g6, d4 knight f6, e5 knight h5, bishop e2, d6, bishop takes h5, g takes h5, and white accepts the gambit pawn with queen takes h5. You can see the diagram position. White has won a pawn. But he's also brought his queen out early. However, black gains the bishop pair and rapid development and compensation. In this variation, we'll look at two games. Last week, we took a look uh, at a couple of games in the Norwegian Rat Gambit. So today, we have another game from my oldest student, Sailor. And here, he's playing Triestino 14. Now, what's interesting, Triestino 14 and Sailor had played the same variation back in, like, October. So now they play again, game 15 on ICC. And you can see... Black plays a very provocative, knight to f6. And here, you would think kind of, black would play knight d5. And that would be kind of a version of an Al Jekyll's defense. But in the Norwegian rat, the very provocative, knight to h5. Now, as we mentioned last week, uh, in the early days, this was known as like maybe the North Sea variation. And bishop e2. White creates a queen plus bishop battery, lines up on the h5 knight, threatens to capture a pawn. And so in the early days, in the 80s, black would play knight back to g7. And white would build up a big center and usually crush black. So the opening didn't really take off. But somewhere around 2006-7, Aronian started playing d6 and said, hey, you want the pawn on h5? Take it, take it. He takes takes and collects a pawn. Now there's often the case in chess, pluses and minuses. Yes, white won a pawn, but black half-opened g-file. And white's also brought his queen out early. 
So the key to this is you play pawn takes pawn. Now, of course, queen takes pawn, rook g8, that's one way to go. And in the video series, uh, we discuss a game that Magnus Carlsen had along those lines where he played black, and he opined that, you know, basically he thought black was okay. Now, Triestino plays the alternative recapture, pawn takes. Well, knight to c6, logical developing move, and knight to f3, more protection on the pawn. But now the next move is very, very important, very important, and a little bit unexpected. Queen to d7. How do you sacrifice a pawn and then just play a, a non-aggressive move like queen to d7? But it's strategically motivated. The point is, is that you actually want to play the queen out to f5 or to g4, trade the queen. Now, why would you trade the queens? Well, one, once you trade the queens, black will have pressure on the pawns on c2 and e5. And secondly, once you trade the queens, the black bishop pair can really come into its own. So it's a little bit, not a little bit, it's like actually very counterintuitive that you would look to trade queens after your pawn down. But if you think about the Benko Gambit, another opening where black sacrifices a pawn in the opening, and then again, counterintuitive there, black often looks to exchange queens because in that opening, a kingside attack is white's best chance, queens off the board, much less chance of a kingside attack. So let's see how this plays out. So, knight to c3, good logical developing move, bam, queen to g4 pretty much forcing a trade of queens. But after queen takes, now the bishop comes out. Now the bishop contemplates chopping off the knight on f3. After bishop f4, adding more protection, you don't rush to capture on f3. Bishop takes, pawn takes, knight to d4. Yes, that forks two pawns, but after white castles queen side, gives back the pawn. When you play knight takes on f3, knight to b5 or knight to d5, White has a humongous attack, but instead you don't worry about being a pawn down. You focus on mobilization. Now, in this game, rook to d1. In the previous game, after castles, uh, Triestino had played knight to d2. And then on rook g8, played f3. But that did not work out well for him because after bishop f5, the pawn on c2 was under attack. The rook was attacking the pawn on g2, and when white castled, the rook invaded on g2, and black was just humongously better because he had monster bishops, his rook was already penetrating on the 7th, and he'd recovered his pawn. And so, in fact, that game is also in the video, along with the aforementioned Magnus Carlsen game. This time, Triestino looks to improve and plays rook to d1. Well... Bishop to g7. Now again, you can see black has possibilities. Bishop takes knight, followed by capturing on e5, recouping his pawn. So let's see what happens. White castles. Well, white castles is actually a very greasy, low-quality hamburger that's uh, produced like places like New Jersey. But some people get addicted to such unhealthy food. But as pertains to chess, yes, white castles kingside. Okay. Anyway, that was a bad, non sequitur bit of humor. So what happens now? You chop the knight. Okay, pawn takes. Now, you only give up your bishop pair if you're getting something in return. In this case, you're recovering your pawn. You now have the better pawn structure. We can see white has doubled f pawns. Bishop takes, bishop takes, and rook over. Well, to white's credit, he is centralized. He has gotten his king fairly safe, but very nice move here by black from a practical point of view, check. Now the point of the check is you make white decide. Does he go to f1 and possibly lose the h2 pawn? Yeah, he would get the e7 pawn back, so that's one decision. Or, well, it turns out computer analysis later shows king to f1 was slightly better way to go, but black in any case has a pretty comfortable advantage. So now, Sailor, who, by the way, is 76 years old, God bless him, we should all be actively playing chess and 
running up and down the lighthouse stairs and doing such things at that age. Anyway, he chops the knight. Now again, you only give up the second bishop if you're getting something in return. Well, what's he getting? He now has a double rook in game where every single white pawn is either isolated or doubled. Okay? So, this is a great example of constantly transforming one type of advantage for another. Okay? So, he trades a pair of rooks. So, rook takes. Now you have a single rook in game. And uh, as we mentioned, definitely black has a better pawn structure. What else? Well, the black rook on the g-file does cut the white king off. And the black king is a little more, uh, a little better placed, closer to the action. So small cumulative advantages. No single one would be considered decisive. But as we said, cumulative advantages, when you add them all up, black has pretty good winning chances. Now, of course, in something similar to this, there's a very famous rook in game, Master Cohn, C-O-H-N, versus Rubenstein, where in a position like this, he actually traded the rooks, and the black king just walked in and, you know, zigzagged him. Well, here, Sailor, very uh, appropriately, activates his rook. Oh, and by the way, that's another small advantage, is that black's on move. So that means when it comes to attacking various pawns, black has first, first go at it. So you can see the pawn on c3 is under attack. If that one falls, the pawns on c2 and f3 are under pressure. So, c4. But now, the problem when you have so many weaknesses is it can be very hard to defend them all. So white does the best he can here. He says, look, the a2 pawn's goner. I can't just sit back and let him grab all my pawns. I have to go counterattack. But now, takes on a2. And again, when we talked about our cumulative advantages, yeah, by going first here, we can see black uh, definitely is leading the way. So, rook takes h7. Now, rook takes on c2. Rook takes on f7. But here, again, our king steps up. By guarding the c7 pawn, we keep the doubled f pawns from becoming passers. Plus, in a quickie, our king might bop over, stop that h pawn, or come up to support our pawns. Well, black protects his f2 pawn, but now it's off to the races. But first, collect the pawn on c4. Okay. Now, by the way, uh, speaking of rook in games, uh, a few years back, I did a 13-volume series for ICC. It's available at the ICC store on rook in games. The first two volumes, I think they're about 35 minutes, but they basically cover all the tactics that you need in a rook in game. Everything from skewer, check and skewer, building a bridge, etc, etc. So, well here, just a very quick visual tells you Black's obviously got to be much better if not winning, because he's got three connected pass pawns on the queen side, and Black has one measly passed h-pawn. That is, White has one measly passed h-pawn. So let's see what happens. How does it play out? You still got to execute. King up, and... The A-pawn is off to the races. Well, H-pawn off to the races. A-pawn going. But now, White does a smart thing. He gets his rook behind the passed pawn. And here, I think probably the only move that I felt like Sailor did not play precisely in this game, he played, in a rush, pawn to A3. What he should have done is he should have used the build a bridge technique. He should have played rook back to C6 h5, a3. Then, on rook a8, he can build a bridge with rook a6, exclamation point. And it's game, set, match, because after the trade, the black pawn will promote first. So rook c6 would have saved a bit of trouble. But, you know how it is. Once you feel like you're winning, you're in a rush, and he played pawn to a3. Well, white sees the moment, got the rook behind the passed pawn. Fortunately for Black, since he still has more passed pawns, it wasn't, uh, you know, too serious. He just shoved the next one. <laughs> one man down, another man steps up. Okay, so now he could play rook b3, but he played rook back. But this time, Sailor saw the build a bridge technique, and he goes rook back. Instead, if he tries to go rook behind, you have rook to b6, 
and then it's very nice. So as it was, the rook went back. But now, rook behind the passed pawn. This time, Sailor gets it right and nails it. This pawn tries to shove. This pawn runs up. Rook slides over. And as we know, rooks are the worst blockaders. The worst. So after c5, white brings the king up. But let's say white had played pawn to h6. No problem. You play pawn to c4, what I like to call connecting the dots. When that pawn goes to h7, you go rook over to h6. You collect it. You still got your queenside pawns connected. No problem. Easy peasy. So in the game, after king g4, c4, I think this is the point where white tossed in the towel. Of course, the evaluation is something ridiculous like plus 8 or plus 9 because the white rook is simply going to be overpowered. And even if black has to give up his rook for the past h pawn, by that time his king will be up to b4 and his two pawns will be running the rook over. So anyway, a very nice game in what we call the, uh, the gambit accepted, where white plays bishop takes, pawn takes, and queen takes. And... This seems like it offers black pretty good counterplay. Now, we have one more game that we were going to share with you on the Norwegian Rat. Let's take a look. So we've got to go to View. We go to My Profile. That gives you a list of your games. And then you can have your own game library, which holds up to 400 games. So there's the two games that we covered last week. Okay, we covered King Marco. And we covered Nathan. Now the next game we're going to cover is against uh, ICC member Ferocious Panda. In fact, very talented young FM uh, played crazy opening against me in an earlier banner blitz. Uh, like I went, I don't know, e4, d4, and he played h5. And then I pushed another pawn, and he managed to win. So I was very happy to see Sailor get a little modicum of revenge here with the Norwegian Rat. Let's see what happened. So, e4, g6, d4, knight f6, e5, and now Ferocious Panda, there's a reason. His nickname is Ferocious. Bam! g4. Holy cow. Nobody ever plays g4. It has to be dealt with. Well, of course, the knight has to go back to g7. No big mystery there. But now he probably pushes the envelope just a little too far on the positional side, and he plays h4. What would you play for black? This looks pretty good. White's got four pawn moves in. But there's a difference between advancing pawns and controlling space and getting, quote, overextended. Sailor did a very nice thing here. He played h5. This strikes back. What is white going to do about the g-pawn? He could take on h5. That's one option. And, of course, he take with the knight. But then he's weakened some squares, noticeably f5. In the game, he pushes by, gaining more space. But now, black switches gears. And that's one thing I've noticed about this Norwegian open, oh, Norwegian rat that Magnus has been playing, is it can easily morph into kind of a French defense type structure. It can morph into kind of a regular Peartz. And sometimes it has the flavor of like a Scandinavian defense. So it's a very flexible opening, okay? Yes, and uh, as Nicholas uh, says, if the pawn moves, it weakens the f5 for the knight. He's absolutely right. So, pawn to d5. So this is why I'm saying that instead of playing pawn to d6, you know, black goes into kind of a super Gurgandizi system, which is a kind of a blo blockade on the light squares type system. So let's see what happens. Bishop to d3. Bishop to g4, just a little probe. And after f3 bishop to f5. So as Nicholas correctly pointed out, that f5 square is very weak because the g and e pawns have run past it. So, knight to e2, being to d7. Okay, knight to g3. So trade those guys, queen takes, and now a uh, computer actually liked the idea of playing knight to e6. And Magnus mentions this rerouting of the knight to e6 in one of his videos, his banner blitz videos. Uh, but Sailor just went for the e6 barricade on the light squares. Well, white continues playing in hyper-aggressive mode. Now, pluses and minuses. If you take that pawn, 
you do leave him with a backward pawn. However, you got to reckon that you also give his pieces access to the e4 square. In the game, Sailor focused on development, contemplating maybe knight to b4, then taking the pawn, and then planting his knight on d5. Well, don't need to worry about that. Panda exchanges, and after queen takes, plays knight to e4, going for the obvious knight f6 check. Well, bishop to e7, get ready to chop that guy off if he visits. But now a little tactical shot. Knight takes e5, knocks out the head of the white pawn chain. Bad news with the pin. Queen goes back to e2, knight goes back home, but now knight to c3, queen over to a5, pinning the knight, and here white missed a bit of an opportunity. He could have played d5. d5 would have made things a bit more complicated. Probably play something like maybe knight b4, check. Oh, and now knight f5. This is where d5 would have been the most interesting. Because, of course, on pawn takes, you then have bishop. On d5, though, you could also complicate things with knight to g3. Or you could chill and play a move like knight to d8. Not a happy move. So, but white, for his part, with a shattered pawn structure and a pawn deficit, should have definitely gone for complications with pawn to d5. Instead, castles, and then once black castles queenside, it's pretty much game over. The pawn on d4 is triple attacked. Uh, the knight to g3 fork was another possibility, absolutely. And now the game does not last much longer because after king b1, black just collects, trades a pair of rooks, and on queen c4, check, and it's all falling apart. Now here, knight e4 was the last chance to try and hang on, but instead, uh, the panda played king in the corner, and just leads to bad news because I ended the game. So anyway, very aggressive play with g4 and then probably pushing the envelope a little too far with h4 because as Nicholas pointed out, once you play h5, you get rid of his g-pawn, then black has good play on the light squares and especially the f5 square. Okay, so that's pretty much it. The Norwegian rat you know, continues to find victims. And now we see why Magnus Carlsen has been playing it for so long.